All right, let's go ahead and open up to John. We're working our way fairly quickly here uh, through the first chapter. Uh, we had to do a lot of groundwork with the prologue and with the ministry of John the Baptist, uh, but now hopefully we can move around a little, move along a little more quickly. We're just going to finish up this Lamb of God. Uh, it's an important thing uh, in the book of John, but even more so later uh, in in the culmination of Israel's prophetic program. So let's go ahead and open up to. John 1. We've already looked at the Son of God identification. Uh, before this, we dealt with the prophet like unto Moses uh, and Christ as the sent one, the emissary uh, who speaks the words of the Father, uh, the words of the one who sent him, who in this case is the Father, uh, does the works of the one who sent him again the Father, and he's going to return to the Father. And now uh, we have Jesus finally, after all this time, I don't know if you realize it, but Jesus hasn't said or done anything up to this time. Uh, it's just been descriptor. Well, now Jesus is going to come on the scene. And that's what we see here in verse 29. So let's, why don't we go ahead and pick it up in verse 29. The next day, so now we're in the next day, uh, remember the first day John the Baptist, the, the leaders of Jerusalem from Jerusalem came uh, and asked him, who are you and what are you doing basically? Uh, and he explained that first of all by saying who he's not. He's not the I am the Christ, but he's preparing the way for the I am, uh, the Christ, the I am Jehovah God of Israel. He's preparing the way, the Christ, the Messiah, the King. Uh, and they wanted to know why he's baptizing and why he's doing these things if he's not that Messiah. Uh, and he's going to explain now as we go down through this that there's someone uh, above him, someone more important to him, uh, someone they should be paying attention with, paying attention to and asking questions about more than John. And that's, of course, the Lord Jesus. So we'll pick it up here in verse 29. Now the next day, seeth Jesus <clears throat> coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at last week. Uh, we looked at that concept, the Lamb of God. We kind of last week looked at uh, how uh, the traditional meaning uh, didn't really uh, hold water. Uh, it, there's a lot of holes in it. We come along, we think we know what this verse uh, says, but then when we do a little more research, a little more looking into it, uh, there really isn't a sacrificial lamb that meets, uh, that takes away the sin of the, earth, sin of the world and that meets these things. And we'll kind of review that at the end of this section. Uh, and so that's the traditional view. We're going to look at an alternate view. Uh, you don't have to give up that view if you don't want to, but I'm just going to give an alternate view. So I just ask that you put that one kind of on hold uh, and look at another way uh, that you can look at this Lamb of God concept. What is this Lamb? Who is this Lamb of God? Uh, what is the sin of the world? You know, most commentators, and I quoted a commentator last week who would love for the traditional explanation of this passage uh, that Christ is that sacrificial lamb who's going to atone for the sins of the world on the cross. Uh, but you see that they say that that's not really what this verse says. This verse talks about the lamb of God who takes away the sin, singular of the world. So we have to ask, uh, what is the sin singular that John is talking about? Not uh, with the sin and according to Paul or sins according to Paul, but what is John talking about when he's talking about the sin of the world? So we're going to look at that, uh, finish that up tonight. Maybe it'll go into next week a little bit. Uh, was John identifying was John identifying Jesus as the sacrificial lamb and atoning sacrifice on the cross for everyone's sins, uh, thereby saving the world? Uh, and last week we saw, at least uh, hopefully uh, you saw that, uh, at least my opinion is no, that's not the answer uh, he's going to give here. That's not what he's saying here. Uh, Paul says something like that. But John isn't saying that. Uh, and it's another instance where we try to read Paul into John uh, and then uh, we lose what John says. And if we lose what John says, the gospel of you, who's the ultimate author of John? It's not really John the apostle or John the author, it's God. 
Uh, and so I'm going to suggest uh, if we set Paul aside now, don't read Paul into this. He's not going to be here for years later. Uh, and just read this text in the context of it, the Old Testament context, uh, in the context of his earthly ministry as confirming the promises to the fathers of Israel, fulfilling his program with Israel, whereby he first blesses Israel, raises her up, makes her the head of all nations, and through Israel. Israel is the conduit of blessings to the rest of the world. So first he saves Israel and then he saves the rest of the world in, with, and through Israel. Uh, that's his prophetic program for the nation of Israel. We'll see that as we go through this passage. So John the Baptist we saw last week. We're not going to redo it this week, but we looked at Matthew 3 and Matthew 11. Uh, he didn't know anything about a suffering servant. He wasn't expecting that, whose death would be an atoning sacrifice for the world, uh, and was completely un, un, uh, unprepared to accept such a notion. Uh, Matthew 11, at the end of John's ministry, uh, and uh, at the end of his life, really, he's just about ready to have his uh, head removed from his body uh, and he sends his disciples to Jesus and says are you the one or should we be looking for another and we looked at the reason why he was asking that and that's going to play a pivotal role in this Lamb of God concept John the Baptist was looking he thought he was paving the way for the I am Jehovah God Messiah Christ King of Israel who is going to come and deliver his people destroy his enemies and set up his righteous kingdom over the earth instead of John sitting in jail in Matthew 11 uh, and well first of all he's sitting in jail <laughs> got one of God's main spokesmen is in jail uh, uh, being persecuted and is about ready to have uh, his head taken off and be put to death. Jesus uh, is being persecuted. Jesus is being rejected by the whole nation, by Galilee, by Jerusalem, Judea and Galilee. The kingdom uh, that John thought was going to be established in power and glory is being uh, taken by violence of its enemies. That's all in Matthew 11. Again, we're not going to turn there and go through that. Uh, and then I did quote a long quote from a traditional uh, commentator who, and his, he says, in his devotional commentaries, he teaches the traditional view, but in his scholarly commentaries, uh, he teaches that that really doesn't hold water. Uh, the traditional view uh, doesn't hold water. And we read that whole quote uh, and uh, looked at that last week. So just to kind of bring that back to mind, uh, and what I just want to uh, show today is that there is uh, another uh, way the concept of lamb and sheep are used uh, in the Old Testament in a major way other than just lambs for, for the sacrificial system. That is one way it's used, uh, but uh, there's another way it's used where God refers to his people as sheep and lambs. Uh, and that's one of the main uh, messages in the themes, I guess you could say, main themes in the Old Testament as a reference to God's people. Uh, it doesn't have to, when you say the word lamb, it doesn't have to automatically, from an Old Testament context, bring to mind a sacrificial lamb going to atone for sins, being put to death to atone for sins. There's another meaning, and it's a large theme in the Old Testament, uh, whereby God identifies his people as the sheep and lambs of God. Uh, and so if we keep that in mind, uh, I'd suggest that could lead to a little bit different uh, interpretation of this passage that is not only going to be more in line with what John the Baptist said, more in line with what John the Apostle's talking about, and especially once you get out into the book of Revelation, uh, it's going to match up with what's going on there. So that's what we're going to work our, our way through uh, to, as the night goes on here. What is often overlooked in order to rush to make uh, John say basically something similar to what Paul says is that there's a simple, uh, a simple solution to this problem, uh, and that is 
uh, that uh, the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament and the Gospel accounts, we'll take a look at that, God's people were often identified as sheep and lambs. We looked at uh, Psalm 23, I am the shepherd. Uh, and so if, he's, if Jehovah is Israel's shepherd, what does that make Israel? The flock, the sheep, the lambs. We looked at Hosea 14 and he talks about Israel being the lamb and the lambs of God. We looked at Ezekiel 34. There's, uh, Ezekiel has seven, several uh, whole chapters about Israel being the sheep uh, and lambs of God. Uh, the only one we're going to pick it up, because we looked at those last week, but to dive into John here, the one we're going to pick it up here this week is John 10. So let's go look at John 10. John 10. It's important also to see, I'll just kind of throw out here, when you talk about sheep, uh, you have basically three basic categories of sheep, right? You have a ewe, which is a, uh, an adult female sheep. You have a ram, that's an adult male sheep. And you have a lamb, which can be either, but usually a male, but either uh, meaning a baby sheep. Uh, and so uh, keep those terms in mind, and we're going to go through them, and we'll look at them as we go through here. But let's just go to John 10. And we'll just see uh, the sheep concept here. All I'm bringing out is the reference. Uh, what was very common theme, a major theme in the Old Testament, the people of God identified as sheep and, and lambs, is carried into the gospel accounts. Uh, let's just pick it up at verse 2. I'm not going to develop this whole passage. We'll be back here a little later. But here I just want to bring out the sheep, and, uh, sheep concept. Verse 2. John 10, verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Uh, so we have a shepherd concept. We have the sheep. Uh, to him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Uh, he's going to uh, call out in the very last half of uh, John 1. He's going to call out some by name. Uh, some uh, followers, uh, disciples of his. So keep that in mind. We're, that's going to come up, be an important concept in the last half of chapter 1 there as we move on. Uh, oh, let's pick it up at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So there we have that sheep concept again. I am the door of the sheep to me, uh, to, by me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. You see, he's talking about being the gate to the sheep, but what's the next verse say? Any man who believes enters that gate. So the sheep represent the men, the man, the person, the believer. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. All right, so I'm just bringing, showing you how this Old Testament, we looked at those Old Testament references, and there's tons more uh, beyond that. Uh, but that concept, that theme, is actually a major theme in John as well, the Gospel of John. Go to the very last verses of John, John 21. John 21, and here uh, Jesus is, I guess you could say, commissioning Peter. Uh, go to John 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. So there you have, he's using the lamb terminology. But look at the very next verse. They're interchangeable. Uh, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Uh, he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So all the way from the beginning to the end of uh, the book of John, from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament uh, and the other gospel accounts as well, uh, God's people are identified as lambs, lambs and sheep. Uh, and I think that's an important thing and might open uh, some further understanding on what that f metaphor means, lamb of God. Uh, and it doesn't always have to refer to a sacrificial lamb. That's one way the Old Testament used lamb and uh, terminology and sheep terminology. Uh, it doesn't, but it can also refer to another major theme in the Old Testament as the lamb and sheep of God, meaning the people of God. All right, 
So we introduced that last week. Uh, we can compare, if we want to do a comparison here, with the Son of God metaphor. Uh, we've already covered that one, and actually go back to John 1, because I think it's important to see how this section, what comes in between, uh, uh, be just before John's test major testimony here, starting in verse 19, uh, and the end of the, the second day, at least, of John's major testimony here, is the Son of God. It's like bracketing this whole section. Look at verse 18. John 1, verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. So there you have the Father and the Son, the Son of God. Uh, and it's uh, referring to a person. Uh, it's referring to God the Son. And, but look how now at the end of this second day anyway, verse 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So they're bracketing this whole, and in between is where you have that Lamb of God. So you got the Son of God and you got the Lamb of God. Uh, and I'd suggest if we think about those two in a sim similar way, uh, that can be, maybe help us understand this metaphor. In reference to the people of God, the Israelites were called son. Uh, Israel as a nation was called the son of God. Israel as individual Israelites were called sons of God. Uh, and their sonship position, they, they uh, gave that up when they went under the law covenant at Sinai. They threw away their sonship. When God in Exodus 4 announces he's going to deliver Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, the Israelites from the Egyptians, he called them his son and they were his sons. He took them out of Egypt on the sonship pr uh, provision uh, principle. Uh, they were just supposed to rely on the grace resident in his Jehovah name and he'd do everything for them. And he carried them along on eagle's wings and brought them to himself and delivered them from the Egyptians. Uh, when they went under that law though, and, and uh, Paul in Galatians explains this when they went under that law. They threw away their sonship position and went back, on, went to, back to the nursery uh, under tutors and governors uh, and uh, went back to the nursery. Uh, and they threw away their sonship position. But they're going to get that sonship position again uh, out there at Christ's second, uh, second return. Uh, they're going to have a foretaste it during that tribulation period, uh, and it's going to come to fulfillment in that kingdom. So you have this idea of Israel was the son, and the Israelites were the sons of God. Uh, and when the Lord Jesus Christ, it says here in verse, uh, in verse 14, of chapter 1 and the word was made flesh when the word was made flesh uh, when God entered into the line of David what did he become he became an Israelite uh, he became a, a son of God along with the other Israelites but he's the not just a son of God he's the son of God because he's also God well, I'd suggest that kind of uh, brings us into this sheep and lamb uh, metaphor. In the Old Testament, Israel, and uh, either as a nation or Israel made up of Israelites, were the sheep and the lambs of God. When God the Son entered into the line of, of human, took on flesh by entering into the human line of David, he became an Israelite. He became a lamb and a sheep of God. But whereas all the other Israelites... Uh, and were a sheep of God, uh, just another sheep of God, a lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God, the sheep of God, because he's also God. He can do something that no other sheep or lamb of God's could do. Uh, he, can, because he's not just of the line of David, he's not just a son of David, He's also a son of David, yes, uh, who's the son of God. Uh, and I think we can think of the son of God and the lamb of God concepts in a similar way. Uh, God is extending, or excuse me, John the Baptist is extending that son of God metaphor that brackets this whole, his whole testimony here 
uh, with this sheep or lamb metaphor uh, God used for the Israelites in the Old Testament in order to refer to one lamb in particular, one particular special person of his own people because he is God as well. Uh, as God as well, as a, you know, it's not just a natural Israelite. He is now. He's born into the human line of David. He's an Israelite. And therefore, he's a sh lamb or a sheep of God. Uh, but he's not just a sheep of God. He's actually God. He's the sheep, the lamb, the son of God. Uh, he can do what no other Israelite can do. No other son of Israel could do. No, excuse me, son of God could do. Uh, and he's going to be able to do it because he's also God. And so we'll pick up on that and go through that. Israel may be a son of God and the Israelites may be sons of God. But the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the incar through the incarnation, is the son of God special, a particular person, a one of a kind, a unique and the only one in his class uh, category. And I, what I'm trying to suggest here is that idea can come now into the Lamb of God uh, concept. Uh, the Israelites may be the Israel, may be the Lamb of God. Uh, the Israelites may be lambs of God. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Uh, he's not just man, he's also God. Uh, and I think if we take that into account, uh, it'll open up and it'll match up to the scriptures better that talk about this lamb concept. All right, so just as Jesus is a specially designated son of God uh, because he is God, so too Jesus is specially designated lamb of God because he is God. Uh, and it has to do with being a member of God's people. But he's not just another Israelite. He's not only a son of David, he's also the son of God. Uh, he's not just a son, he's the son. He's not just a lamb or a sheep of God. He's the lamb of God. Uh, and that's what John's pointing to. Notice it says here in verse 29, he says the next day, Jesus, uh, Jesus coming unto him. Now, this is the first uh, interaction in the narrative. I mean, obviously, we've been talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in the prologue, uh, and J John's been referring to him in his testimony. But now Jesus actually enters the scene. He comes on the scene, and that prompts John to notice. And he looks at him, and he says, there's the la the." lamb of God. He's not just another lamb. He's not just another sheep he, uh, like the other Israelites are. He's the lamb of God because he's God, the son. He's a special, he's a distinct, he's a unique uh, lamb of God. The lamb of God metaphor also works in this immediate context because it brings together uh, the two identifications we've already looked at. We've looked at the son of God identification and we've looked at the prophet like unto Moses identification. And it brings those two together. Uh, Jesus ministered in Israel's midst and was an Israelite. That's remember what uh, that's what was required of the prophet, Deuteronomy 18:15. He's going to the pro this prophet like unto Moses is going to operate in the midst of the nation, uh, and he would be one of the brethren. Fits the bill of the prophet. Uh, but he also, but he wasn't any Israelite or lamb, but one in particular who is also the I am Lord, uh, their shepherd. And we just read, uh, if we go back to chapter 10, let's see how he's a unique lamb. So we have Jesus as the lamb, uh, as not just a lamb of God, like the Israelites who were called by God. Uh, he was the lamb of God. But look what else he is. And we read this earlier, so I'm just going to point it out again. Uh, he says here, look at verse 7. Then Jesus said again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door to the she of the sheep. Uh, so Jesus Christ, he's the one, he's the unique lamb of God. He's not only the lamb, he's also the doorway for the sheep gate that the sheep go through. But even that's not all. He's also more than that even. Verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. That's why this lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, is unique and designated for a special purpose. He's not just the lamb, he's the sheep gate and he's the shepherd. 
all in one. He's God the Son. Uh, he's not just a lamb of God, a sheep of God, because he's the people of God, the, of especially that believing remnant of Israel. He's the, the lamb of God because he is God. He's not just the, the specially designated lamb. He's the gate to the barn and the gate to the sheep gate and the shepherd. He's God. And that's, bring, that's why he's the Lamb of God. Jesus was the unique one of God's lambs as a member of the believing remnant of Israel, the Lamb of God, because he was also the shepherd and the sheep gate uh, for the lambs. Now let's see uh, an example of this. We actually keep in mind that John is the only one that uses this lamb metaphor uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one uh, and the only time in the Gospel of John is by these two instances with John the Baptist. Uh, and then, you know, it's not mentioned at all. It's not even mentioned in John's epistles. Uh, it's not mentioned again till John's book of Revelation. And so before we go to the book of Revelation, I just want to give uh, a real, I think, easy to understand example of, of what this is, what we're going to look at in Revelation uh, first from the Old Testament. And maybe that will help us uh, see some things in Revelation. So it may be surprising, but we're going to go look at the story of Nathan and David. Remember, David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And, uh, and arranged uh, for the murder of Uriah, her husband. Uh, and it's been a while, you get the idea, David's been using uh, the long suffering of God to ignore his sin and to carry on as though God didn't care. God is now going to send Nathan to him and he gives David a parable. And that's what I want to go look at now. I, I'm sure you're mostly familiar with this story, so I'm not going to go into the details. But I, and really all I want to do is show this uh, sheep metaphor at work. So go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. God is sending Nathan now. He's basically saying, go wake up David because if he uh, doesn't deal with this issue with me, I'm, he's going to be put to death. Uh, and God has been dealing with him on the basis of the grace resident in his Jehovah name. Remember, uh, David was a murderer, an adulterer, and he coveted Bathsheba, so he was also an idolater. And God sends Nathan. Uh, he's been dealing with David on the basis of the grace resident in his Jehovah name. Remember how that works? That reverses the order of the law. Uh, the grace resident in his Jehovah name, in, uh, when God operates according to that, he shows mercy and grace first. And then depending how the person responds to that, it's either more mercy and grace or Ra vengeance, wrath, and judgment. And now God has been merciful to David. Uh, and David, it sounds like, ha because da God had to send Nathan, David's kind of been misusing the long suffering of God. God sends Nathan and says, give him this parable. Uh, and so let's read this parable. Verse one, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing. Now, uh, we really... We're just focusing really on verse 3 here. We don't really aren't going to get into any of the background story of this. I gave a little background. My point here is see how uh, the use of sheep and lamb are used in the Old Testament. Uh, and suggesting that will help us when we get to the book of Revelation. So the poor man, verse 3, had nothing save one little ewe lamb. Now do you remember my definition of sheep, uh, the various kinds of sheep? Uh, I, that's a contradiction in terms. A ewe lamb. A ewe is an adult female, tree, uh, adult female sheep. A lamb is a baby sheep. Uh, and so you have to put this together. This is a, a metaphor. There's something more going on here. Obviously, uh, Bathsheba wasn't a, a, a baby a human. She was a full-grown woman. She was, a, in the metaphor, a ewe sheep. Uh, she was a, uh, an adult female sheep in the metaphor. Uh, so where does the lamb come in? 
She wasn't a baby sheep. The lamb is indicating something else, not the age of the person. It's indicating the status of the person. And Bathsheba was in a particularly precarious position. She was uh, in a dangerous position. Uh, she needed protection. Uh, she was at someone else's disposal to be misused. And so like a, it was a lamb in that sense. And so just keep that in mind, this you, that's an adult female sheep, uh, lamb, that's a baby sheep. Uh, so they can't, they're contrary if, if you talk about age, actual age or maturity of the, of the person, uh, you, they're contradictory. But so lamb refers to the status of the person, how they come. Uh, that they're in a dangerous uh, predicament. They, they're in a dependent state uh, that can be taken advantage of and things like that. And of course, that's exactly what David did with Bathsheba. He had a very powerful, rich man uh, who took advantage of Uriah's ewe sheep. Uriah's ewe uh, sheep. Uh, and which, verse 3, so just keep that in mind. We're going to run into something like that over in uh, Revelation that will help us with the Lamb of God concept. So the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb. Uh, and now I just want you to think about these phrases. I'm just going to point them out. We're not going to look at them in depth, but hopefully when I read these phrases, uh, some things come to your mind. So let's read them and see what happens. Which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and, it, uh, and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. All right, so there you have all those phrases. Do those sound kind of familiar? Uh, just look at um, the first one. Uh, he had been brought, he had been bought and nourished up. Uh, Luke tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ in his youth uh, had been nourished and brought into the fullness of God before God. It did eat of his, or, uh, it grew, and let's see, it grew up together with him. It was in the midst of him. Uh, and it grew up with his children. It was, he was one of the brethren. Here, uh, there was one of the family. That's kind of like that prophet of Moses. He was, was to be in the midst of the nation, of the family of Israel, uh, and be among the brethren. He did eat of his own meat. We haven't gotten there yet, but a little later in John, uh, when he's talking at, to, uh, to the Samaritan woman, just after that, he says, my meat is to do the will of the Father. And he drank of his own cup. We know from Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to drink of that cup of wrath, drink of the Father's cup. And he lay in his bosom. What did just, we just read in the prologue? Uh, the Son resides in the bosom of the Father and was unto him as a daughter here in this metaphor with uh, Bathsheba. But uh, keep this in mind, it would be for the Lord Jesus Christ. He resided there as his Son, the Son of God. And there, was a and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. So you got uh, the rich man with the one little ewe lamb, uh, David, uh, the, 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 the rich guy in the parable here, uh, and he's gonna, he doesn't want to use one of his own flock. He's got a whole big flock. So he takes the little ewe lamb uh, of the poor man and takes that to feed the stranger that's passing by. And uh, when David heard that, the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was, come, that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Uh, and so David gives his own death sentence. And when you get the answer to this, how did David get out of that death sentence, you read that in Psalm 51. You know what he does? He falls on the grace resident in God's Jehovah name. And that's not part of what we're getting at here today. But verse 3 is the, what I wanted to get at here, this ewe lamb. Here you have a full-grown uh, female lamb, uh, female sheep, uh, who is also described as a lamb. 
uh, because not because uh, she's a baby, a lish baby sheep literally, but because she's uh, in a dependent state. Uh, she's in a weak state. She's in a humble uh, and uh, someone who can be taken care of, it, uh, uh, who, who needs to be taken care of and can be taken advantage of easily. All right, so keeping all in that mind, now let's go to the book of uh, Revelation. Revelation. In John the A, notice I have John the A here, versus John the B. John the B is John the Baptist. John the A is John the author, uh, John the, or John the Apostle, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, he also wrote the book of Revelation, and it's the only other place where the Lamb of God is mentioned. Uh, the Lamb of God is further described, and let's go to, let's read it rather than just my notes. Let's go to Revelation 5. Revelation 5. And again, it's not my intent uh, to develop the book of Revelation here or to go through all these details. The intent here is to see this Lamb of God concept and what it means to John. And if this is what it meant to John the Apostle, uh, you can be sure uh, that this is what it meant to John the Baptist. So let's go ahead and read here. Pick it up at verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So there you have another metaphor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's not only the lamb of God, he's the lion of Judah. Uh, and the, uh, the root of, of David, there you have another metaphor. He's a root coming out of the human line of David. He's a, a descendant of David. Uh, he's God himself and fleshed into the human line of David to become an Israelite, a sheep, a lamb of God, because that's what the believing Israelites at least were. Uh, but he's not just another lamb or sheep of God. He's the lamb of God because he's also God. And he's the lion. It has all these metaphors for him: the lion of God, the root of Judah. Or excuse me, the lion of Judah and the root of David. Uh, and he prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Here we have the lamb metaphor again. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now the only thing I'm expanding on here is this lamb of God has seven horns. Now uh, most of us don't have any farming background, but even I know a lamb doesn't have horns. What we learn in the uh, Revelation is this Lamb of God is really a ram of God. Like Bathsheba was a ewe lamb, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is a ram lamb. And if you put those two together, you can kind of see uh, how this is going to develop uh, with regard to this lamb concept. He's a ram with seven powerful horns, uh, and he's going to destroy his enemies, deliver his friends, establish the kingdom. He's the ram. He's, in fact, a ram lamb. Like Bathsheba was a ewe lamb, uh, Jesus Christ is a ram lamb. And he says, uh, and he came and took the book, verse 7, out of his hand. Uh, so here in the book of Revelation, and, and we see that this lamb is actually a ram, has seven horns, uh, and the ram lamb uh, is reference to Jesus Christ, uh, designated for a special relationship to God as the one who will exercise ultimate power and glory and authority over all. Uh, and we won't turn there now because we're going to uh, do some more in the book of Revelation. Uh, but just keep that if you want to look up Matthew 28, 18, after his death and resurrection, he says, I've been now given all power and authority. All power and authority. So just as the prologue, just as the prologue and John the Baptist testified to Jesus Christ being God's specially designated son, uh, so too Jesus Christ is specially, uh, is specially designated ram, lamb of God. Uh, he's, a, he's a powerful lamb. He's the uh, delivering lamb. 
conquering, that'd probably be the better word, the conquering lamb. Again, John, John is the, uh, John the author is the, uh, of this gospel is the only Bi Bible writer to uh, refer to Jesus Christ with the metaphor. That's a direct, uh, direct uh, comparison with this lamb concept. Uh, and he's the only one to use it. It's used twice. Uh, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, on the lips of John the Baptist, that's what we're dealing with uh, right now in, John, in uh, John 1, but then it's used 29 times in the book of Revelation, and I've listed some out here. We're not going to uh, look at all those, but they're for your, if you want to look those up for your own reference, that might make an interesting study. When the author John the author uses this metaphor in Revelation. It is always the ram lamb of power and authority, war and glory. Uh, the ram lamb comes to destroy his enemies, purging the world, listen carefully, purging the world of sin. That goes back to John the Baptist. He's expecting this Lamb of God to take away, not in the sense of uh, going to atoning sacrifice on the cross of, the, of a sacrificial lamb, but he's expecting that Ram Lamb of God to come and remove sin, singular, wickedness. Uh, maybe the best word would be unrighteousness from the world. Uh, thereby saving the world, destroying his enemies, saving his friends, uh, and in that way, saving the world. That's Israel's prophetic program. Uh, see, that's not what God's doing today. Today, God is displaying the righteousness of God in saving his enemies because he has no friends. Once he restarts Israel's prophetic program, it's gonna switch and he's gonna to go to displaying the righteousness of God in destroying his enemies and saving his friends. And he's gonna do it through the ram lamb of God. And he's gonna usher them into that kingdom and he's going to establish, recreate the nation of Israel out of that believing remnant, make her the head of all the nations of the earth, fully bless her, abundantly bless her, raise her above all the nations of the earth and with Israel and through her rise, he's gonna send his blessings out to the friendly Gentile nations. All the unfriendly ones, all the enemy ones have been destroyed, wiped out uh, and they're now he's reigning uh, in righteousness in that kingdom. All right, so let's just look, Go see, since we, we didn't leave Revelation, I don't think you did, uh, and let's just look at a couple uh, instances of this ram lamb of Revelation. He's the messianic conquering lamb. Uh, he's seen to be slain uh, but is now alive from the dead, receiving worship and power and wealth and might and honor and blessing and glory. Uh, the important thing to realize here is he's not seen uh, as slain till we get to, Je to the book of Revelation. What's going to happen is they're going to look on the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns, the ram lamb of God returns to save his friends and destroy his enemies. They're going to look on the one they pierced the one they slew, and they're going to fall on the grace resident, his Jehovah name. And when that happens, let's just read this chapter 5, uh, verse 6. Let's read a little more in chapter 5. We read through verse 7. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors and the prayers of the saints and so forth. So he's going to receive worship and praise. Uh, from the saints, but he's going to also going to do something with the, uh, uh, the wicked. Go to ch uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 15. He's also going to powerfully uh, exercise wrath and judgment on the, power, the powerful on the earth and the, uh, and the revered on the earth. Look at uh, chapter 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth... Uh, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman uh, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall upon us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And who's there? And from the wrath of the Lamb. 
Remember John the Baptist in Matthew 3? He says, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? John's looking, when he said, talks about the Lamb of God, he's talking about the Ram, Lamb of God, who's coming in wrath and vengeance and judgment to destroy his enemies, deliver his friends, and establish, uh, purge the world of wickedness, unrighteousness, sin, and establish his righteous kingdom over the whole earth. That's what this Ram, Lamb of God does. Go to... Uh, and we'll just, we won't turn to the next one. He tri tri stands triumphant on Mount Zion. He defeats all his enemies. Let's jump ahead here to chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 14. Oh, uh, let's, I guess, let's begin at verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So these are the enemies of God. Uh, but what's going to happen to them? Verse 14, these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Uh, for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Uh, and they that are with him are called the chosen and the faithful. Uh, and so he's going to conquer his enemies. He's the ram, lamb of God. Uh, he's going to destroy his enemies. He's going to come in vengeance, wrath, and judgment. Well, John, what he, that's what he's talking about. Who, taught, who, called, who uh, warned you to flee the wrath to come? Here's the lamb of God, the ram, lamb of God, who's going to come and be the conquering Messiah. Uh, and destroy all the enemies, the earth's enemies, uh, purging sin and wickedness and unrighteousness out of the world uh, to save the world through his kingdom. And actually, that's what we get. Again, we won't go, we'd have to almost read the whole 22nd chapter there, but he's going to establish uh, God's kingdom on earth. The ram, lamb of God is going to establish that kingdom on earth, the righteous reign of Israel. Excuse, yeah, the righteous, his righteous reign through the nation of Israel over the whole earth. Uh, and then the world will be saved in uh, God's prophetic program for the nation of Israel. And in our account here in John, uh, John points his disciples to Christ as the mighty Lamb of God who will deliver his own through the baptism with the Holy Spirit uh, and will purge sin and enemies out of the world. Uh, unrighteousness might be a good word. You know, the short word for unrighteousness is sin, right? Uh, and he's going to purge it of sin and enemies out of the world through the baptism with fire. Uh, and again, we saw that over in Matthew 3. Uh, and let's go back to John 1 now. <clears throat> John 1, with all that in mind. Now when we read this, when uh, John the Baptist, at the same time, if we add the accounts from Matthew in here, is warning them, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? He's coming. He's got his axe to the root of the wicked trees. Uh, he's already fanning the unrighteous chaff into the fire. Matthew 3. Uh, here's the Lamb of God. He's the one that's going to do this. He's the ram, lamb of God that's revealed uh, completely in the book of Revelation. The lamb of God who takes away the sin singular of the world. He's going to purge the world of wickedness, sin, unrighteousness, and establish his king, righteous kingdom over the earth and rule his people in that, that earth, that kingdom. What's, what are they preaching? The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. The king is here uh, and the kingdom's at hand. That's what John's talking about with this lamb of God. Uh, it's not the traditional uh, viewpoint. It's, he's, a ram, he's the ram lamb of God. Uh, and he's the ram, the adult male sheep that's going, has the seven horns that's going to destroy his enemies. But at his first coming, he comes uh, in the predicament of a lamb in danger, dependent upon God to take care of him uh, and to preserve him and to see him through all this. In, in his humanity, in weakness, humbleness, uh, and in dependency, 
uh, in that sense. But he's actually, you know, just like Bathsheba, was in the predicament of a lamb, but she was really a full-grown female sheep. So too Christ is in his first coming, he's in the predicament of a lamb. Uh, but he's a full-grown um, male sheep, I guess you could say, uh, with seven horns uh, ready to come and destroy his enemies. And that's what John is talking about. And he's going to mention that twice as we go through here. So let's go ahead. Uh, when he talks about the sin of the world, sin here is singular. At his first coming, uh, he comes in danger and dependency, humbleness, weakness, uh, maybe that'd be a good word to add to the list here. Weakness, uh, and, like as a lamb, uh, and to dispel the sin of the world of unbelief. So that's his first coming. The sin in the gospel of John is the sin, singular, of unbelief. But uh, when he comes the second time, it's going to be the sin of unrighteousness. Let's look at John 16. Now he's uh, in his first coming when he comes as the lamb uh, of God, the ram lamb of God. Uh, he's coming in the predicament of that lamb and dependency, weakness, humbleness, danger, uh, and uh, to e easily taken advantage of, that kind of idea. And, go to, and he's come in John, he's going to tell us, to dispel the sin of unbelief. Look at John 16. John 16 verses 8 and 9. John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he's talking about sending the Spirit after he leaves, he will reprove the world of sin. There we have uh, the word sin in the singular again. Uh, it's not he's going to uh, reprove every one of their individual sins. It's there, he's going to reprove the world of sin, of unrighteousness. Uh, and uh, of righteousness and of judgment, verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. The sin in John, the Gospel of John, is the, in the singular, is the sin of unbelief. Christ came in a weakened, predicament, dependent position to dispel in John's Gospel and his earthly ministry the sin of unbelief. When he comes back the second time, well, let's look at one more instance. Go to chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should, not have, uh, should have eternal life. Excuse me, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the belief. That's what Christ came to do in this earthly ministry, to dispel the sin of unbelief. When he comes a second time, he's coming to dispel. And let's go back to our grace resident, his Jehovah name we spent so much time on. He's giving them, he's responding to idolaters and rebels uh, and enemies on the basis of grace and mercy first. That's his first coming. Now, depending on how they respond to that, if they receive it in faith and repent and return to the Lord, they're going to get more mercy and grace. They're going to be protected through that tribulation period and be taken into the kingdom. If they respond to the grace resident of his Jehovah name by becoming more rebellious, more sinful, more unrighteous, more idolatrous, reject the grace resident of his Jehovah name, taking in vain the name of the Lord, then, then they receive the vengeance and wrath and judgment. And that's what's coming, going to be uh, displayed, manifested at the second coming of Christ. Uh, the ram, lamb of God, the lamb aspect is, is uh, brought to the forefront in his first coming. The ram aspect is going to come at his second coming. And John was expecting that ram, lamb of God, to be kicking into action quicker than it appeared to him uh, it should have been doing. Uh, and the point of this, he's going to purge out the sin of the world. All right. And I think we'll just go ahead and close off with that. Let's just finish reading our passage here, uh, and then we'll close for tonight. 
let's go and so we just read verse 30 hopefully that uh, brought out some of that uh, we'll probably wrap that up this week uh, which taketh away the sin of the world at his first coming the sin of the world was the sin of unbelief uh, he's going to dis dispel that he's going to send the holy spirit after his resurrection to again try to dispel the sin of unbelief uh, and then at his second coming he's going to come to dispel to purge to take away to bear away the sin of the world all unrighteousness is going to be purged uh, th cast into the uh, the uh, lake of fire satan's going to be cast into that bottomless pit uh, and for a thousand years it's going to be ruled that righteous kingdom all unrighteousness is going to be purged and what goes into that kingdom uh, is righteous is the, he's going to establish his righteousness all right and i knew him not uh, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? Uh, again, that's Israel's prophetic program, right? That's God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. It all begins with Israel. Israel needs to receive her king and Messiah and Savior first. Israel needs to be blessed first so that God can make her the head of all nations so she can send out God's blessings to the whole world. But Israel is rejecting the king and the Messiah and the Lord. So it throws a monkey wrench in the prophetic program. It shuts it down. And you see that happening at the stoning of Stephen uh, in Acts. All right. So and he comes baptizing with water. Why is that so important? Because Ezekiel said uh, that when Christ comes uh, to bring in the kingdom, he's going to set up Israel's national cleansing program. And it's going to begin with, a na with their water baptism, a national water baptism, national repentance of sins, and national, uh, national confession of sins uh, and national repentance. And so they're going to enter in that water baptism, and then that's going to lead into the spirit baptism, and then that's going to lead to the fiery baptism, and that's when all sin is going to be purged out of the world. And I knew him not, or verse 32, and John bare witness. He didn't know who it was, uh, but he bore witness, saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. So he's there uh, water baptizing. Uh, Jesus comes to identify himself with the nation of Israel, come under their, uh, their national debt of sin, uh, identifies with their national debt of sin. As an Israelite, he's under the nation's debt of sin. He had no sin of his own. He's not coming uh, for his own sin. The, they were coming to identify with Israel's national debt as a citizen and as a member of the nation of Israel. That's what in John, what he's going to the cross to die for. Uh, it's not the sins of the world. He's going to cross to die for his friends and the nation of Israel's to pay off the nation's debt of sin under the curses of the law and the courses of punishment and save them from that predicament. And I knew him not, but he didn't know who he was. Uh, but this father who sent him explained to what's going to happen. But he that sent me to baptize with water said said the same unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Uh, this is someone special. He's not just someone that receives the Spirit. He's someone that gives out the Spirit. He's the Lord God. Uh, he's, well, let's see what John, how John concludes. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. This is no, uh, not just another Israelite. It's not just another son of God uh, as an Israelite would be or the nation of Israel be. It's not just another lamb of God's or a, lamb, or a sheep of God's. This is the lamb of God, the son of God, because he's also God. Let's close with a word of prayer.